I, I really am very pleased uh, to make this presentation, and I'm, I really appreciate everyone for, for tuning in. Uh, it seems many of you have tuned in from quite far away, so I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the invitation to speak to you all about methodical scenario development. I've titled the presentation uh, with a little bit of humor. I've titled it Scenario because I believe that too often the subject of scenario development is treated lethargically or cynically. And I've heard people say on numerous occasions in various war games, exercises, and analyses, do not fight the scenario. Indeed, I have myself been guilty of saying this, and do not fight the scenario is an admonishment to those who would be so bold as to question the assumptions underpinning a particular question of strategy. It's implied that doing so would disrupt analysis. My perspective is that scrutiny of assumptions is one of a strategist's principal duties, so it is only with a tongue partly in my cheek that I offer this encouragement that strategists treat scenario development with greater attention. So I hope you all have the, the paper slides as we proceed through the briefing. I'm going to prompt everyone to, to advance the slide by just saying next slide. So moving on to the purpose, I have several purposes today. Ellie and Katie are putting forth a great series of lectures at Castle, and I'm happy to support their objectives of presenting practical observations for those who are beginning their careers in strategic analysis, especially, although not exclusively, war gamers. Unlike the two prior speakers in this series, Dr. Sabin and Dr. Perla, I have not been at this for too long. So my hope is that I can present my thoughts and observations in order to prompt those of you to contribute your perspectives to the discussion as well. My plan is to lightly analyze processes and basic concepts of scenario development and to present in contrast two major ways of thinking about scenarios. I would like to highlight some authors and pieces of literature that are helpful and significant I would like to tell you about a scenario development project we conducted in 2010 and 2011. And I think most of all, I want to persuade you that scenarios are fundamental components of strategic analysis and that their creation is a serious undertaking that can be supported with a wide variety of structured methods. Next slide. I should warn you that my presentation is colored by some of the things I've been doing lately. Although I am working on another project at the moment, this presentation is drawn from work I did for the community of senior operations research analysts that steer this scenario-based strategic planning process in the Department of Defense. That group works on ways to optimize force structure, force sizing, and capability mix in the U.S. military. So the end products are decisions about acquisitions, manpower, and budget over the long term. They're not intelligence estimates. If you're familiar with what used to be called the defense planning scenarios, then you know what I'm speaking about. I haven't been working in national security policy, per se, so the strategic studies supported by my work are not the type to produce statements of national objectives vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular security problem or area of interest. Also in the past and in this project, I will tell you a little bit about today, I've focused on ground combat and irregular warfare. I was an Army officer, and I have been working for the Marine Corps, especially the ground combat element of the Marine Corps, since 2008. So my comments usually do not pertain to the maritime and air domains. Also, my interest in irregular warfare means that the types of scenarios I have tended to work on are about social instability within foreign sovereign states. Furthermore, I was directly charged with developing methods of scenario development. So if it seems that my presentation is unusually concerned with process more so than output, there is a reason. I should also mention that the presentation is unclassified. Next slide. I must acknowledge that this presentation is partly taken from prior work. In 2011, I made a presentation about scenario development for strategic analysis of regular warfare to the Military Operations Research Society Annual Symposium at the Naval Postgraduate School, and I also wrote a report for Moore's later that year that I'm told will soon appear on the website of the Defense Technical Information Center. The Operations Analysis Division of the Marine Corps Combat Development Command and the Strategic Support to Strategic Analysis Steering Committee of the Defense Department sponsored these presentations and the project they were about. And I must thank all the people principally involved in that project who are listed at the bottom of the slide. There were also many cheerful experts and action officers who graciously participated in the project. Thanks to all who supported us. Next slide. Enough with the administrivia. Let's start by discussing in a lighthearted way some rather common and unfortunate attitudes towards scenarios and their development. 
Beginning at the top, but in no particular order, I've listed what I believe are some misperceptions about scenarios. The first is that strategic analysis begins after some higher authority has already passed us this scenario and that this scenario is completely infallible. I believe that strategic analysis begins when we define our question and our assumptions, and therefore the development of scenarios is a primary task of strategists. They are not infallible, the scenarios, and we should strive to improve their quality rather than accept their flaws when they are obvious. Some have suggested that there is no way to produce scenarios transparently, repeatably, or rigorously. Cynics will say that the development of the scenario is when competing stakeholders jockey to insert features and conditions that will maximize the opportunity to highlight their respective capabilities and interests. So the lack of rigor in this view is an artifact of the emphasis on horse trading. More than once I have heard it suggested that defense scenarios are created by, and, and I say this jokingly, barricading two staff officers in a windowless office in the Pentagon and waiting until they emerge hungry and unshaven many days later with a scenario. While this is a joke, I think it reflects a sense that scenarios are given by a mysterious oracle rather than through collaborative effort and process. I've also heard it said that the scenarios really don't matter. I think this kind of apathy is really unfortunate because the way we visualize the future will shape the decisions we make in anticipation. Some others have suggested the idea that uh, prediction is futile. And while I sort of agree that prediction is futile, I also think it's beside the point. We do not use scenarios to accomplish accurate predictions like we are making a casino bet. We use them to facilitate planning. Some have it that scenarios are obstacles to good analysis, either because collecting good data, articulating a story, and defending it credibly are simply too hard, or because talking about mere possibilities detracts from scientific treatments of more concrete or not social problems. This is where I want to motivate our community of strategic analysts, again, with tongue-in-cheek, to reject these perceptions. We should be upset and disappointed, like King Leonidas and William Wallace, or at least unimpressed, like the Olympic gymnast who took home the silver medal, when we hear these views pass unchecked. Next slide. Why should we care about scenarios? I would argue that when senior leaders make decisions upon the basis of recommendations drawn from scenario-based studies, they are accepting the analytic assumptions encapsulated by the underlying scenario. And so the quality of their decisions ultimately derive from the quality of the assumptions encapsulated by scenarios written by somebody else. Let's hope they did their homework. Strategic leaders need to organize their ends or objectives, ways to accomplish those ends, and means by which to prosecute the ways. They require boundaries to focus their consideration of alternatives. So scenarios provide an environment or a scene that serves these purposes. A good scenario is essentially a formulation of the problem about which we are concerned. Moreover, because different stakeholders will have different preferences, collaborative processes to create scenarios are helpful to illuminate areas of agreement or disagreement about fundamental assumptions. This is another reason why methodical scenario development is important, because methods, especially group methods, provide ground rules to suppress unbridled argument. Ultimately, they help to produce agreement about the sets of assumptions that could and should accompany a strategic decision. This agreement, if accomplished transparently, provides insurance against the possibility that unsatisfied stakeholders will defect from the process at some point later. Another point not expressed on this slide is that methodically developed scenarios provide pedigree and an audit trail that permits users to identify, isolate, and repair flaws or make modifications to suit their particular needs. When scenarios aren't methodically developed and we don't understand their sources and origins or the process by which they were derived, we cannot fix them easily as if there is some, if there is some problem with them in the future. In providing boundaries, scenarios integrate many different types of assumptions. The primary and most obvious types are the physical location being studied and the time frame in terms of both point and duration, when in the future we are interested. Scenarios designate geography, topography, and season, but they also designate political and social phenomena, such as elections, economic upheaval, or social instability. Because we in the defense community tend to plan for the worst case, it is often safe to assume that scenarios will paint dire pictures of the future, but we should not flatly assume that every possible factor in a scenario will be absolutely negative. The world is rarely that simple, and pieces of scenarios should be logically consistent with each other. 
I would add one other important reason to develop scenarios methodically, that it is much easier to defend a methodically developed scenario against detractors in a war game. Somebody who disagreed with the assumptions in a scenario might say to the author, hey, that's a nice story, but it wouldn't happen that way. If the scenario author used a transparent method and maintained the pedigree, then the author merely needs to challenge the detractor to produce an equally thoughtful body of evidence to suggest another scenario. When scenarios aren't methodically developed, it isn't so easy to defend yourself. This obstacle is more than sufficient to deter such challenges. Harvey DeWeird of the Rand Corporation, who I'll speak about later, noted this back in the 70s. Next slide. The misperceptions about scenarios are reflected in the lack of emphasis the very idea of scenarios and scenario development receives in at least Defense Department literature. The term scenario gets used hap haphazardly, and it remains undefined in the Joint Dictionary. According to one Air University master's thesis published in 1994, while the number of articles written about scenarios steadily increased from an average of 22 per year in the 70s to 280 per year in the early 90s, the number of articles about scenario development remained stagnant at about one or less over the same period. I think this first quote at the top of the, the second line, but the first quote on this slide illustrates one reason why this may be the case. Writing scenarios is often thankless work. I think this is partly, although I, I feel thanked plenty, I must say that. Um, I think this is partly because people either perceive some threat to their interests, inherit in someone else's scenario, or because a scenario inevitably gets confused for a prediction. And while there's only one way for a prediction to, produ to prove correct, there are infinite ways in which a scenario can appear to offer an incorrect prediction. For some, a scenario is an instrument of drama, a story told to set the stage before the real acting begins. This perspective, I think, bears some truth because scenarios are ultimately not useful if they are not convincing. So they must capture the imagination at least somewhat in order to invest stakeholders psychologically in, revolve, in resolving some problem anticipated in the future. And they must do so elegantly. That is, a scenario need not articulate every detail about future possibilities when a few facts will do just fine. There is no requirement that scenarios be lengthy if they capture the essential elements of a situation effectively. I have offered another definition of a scenario from a guru of private sector scenario-based planning, and that's Peter Schwartz, and I think this starts to define the idea of a scenario fairly well. But there are really many other useful definitions, and I only mean to present this one here as an example. I don't advocate a particular one, but I do think it's worth thinking about what a scenario really is for you and for your particular project. I offer the definition of scenario development at the bottom of the page. I think that scenario development is part art and part science. Good scenarios tell an interesting story and convey what is often someone else's or a group of other people's subjective judgment. In fairness, those judgments may come from experts who've honed their knowledge over a long period of time, but they are still judgments about the future. We can also say that there are some ways in which scenarios involve scientific thought. We, for example, we can extrapolate trends via regression of empirical data, and we can make assessments about physical environments relying upon meteorological, climatological, geological, and geographical knowledge. I think it is also important to point out that scenarios are deliberately about unreality. We don't know what the future holds, and we aren't striving for accurate predictions, so our humility required, requires us to say up front that these are unreal characterizations about states of conflict in the future. That doesn't mean that we don't value realism. It just means we acknowledge with humility that the stories we tell are not real. Now, you could set your scenarios in the past, and although there are reasons to do so, most questions of defense strategy are forward-looking, and so scenarios are, in my mind, set in the future. Finally, I point out that we develop scenarios to enable analysis, especially planning. Next slide. I want to dig into the evolution of scenario-based studies in our community. It really begins with the emergence of the United States as a military superpower in World War II. Military leaders began to grapple with the Soviet Union as a principal adversary and with the now truly global nature of state conflict. It was a natural thing to begin to write down different versions of the future and to strive to plan against them. It was really Herman Kahn, who it is said was the muse who inspired Stanley Kubrick's film Dr. Strangelove, who popularized scenario planning beginning in the early 60s. Kahn's writings envisioned limited nuclear war and its aftermath, and these, this was terrifying to the general public. 
This contributed to the propagation of civil defense systems and programs in the mid-20th century. But his applications of scenarios and the line of reasoning that emerged were incredibly powerful. They helped drive the debate over the policy of massive retaliation in Eisenhower's new look, Kennedy's flexible response, and what eventually became the American second strike policy, or the allied second strike policy, of mutually assured destruction. Kahn's ideas, especially that limited nuclear war was winnable, were tested almost as soon as they were articulated. The Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, as well as subsequent close calls during the Cold War, demonstrated how the notion of a limited nuclear engagement was both undesirable and avoidable. So it is fair to say that Kahn made the use of scenarios in strategic analysis both famous and infamous. But it was really the petroleum company Royal Dutch Shell that began to formalize the usage of scenarios for planning. Pierre Wack was a somewhat eccentric, eccentric French executive at Shell who was influenced by Sufi and Hindu mysticism. He recognized how unrealistic were the regression lines, predicting unlimited increase in fuel production and sales, and he could also see how geopolitical realities in the Middle East could lead to significant shocks in the petroleum industry. Although it's a bit debatable, WAC became famous for predicting the oil shocks caused by military conflicts in the Middle East, and he helped Shell prepare for them and emerge favorably. Scenarios became a way for leaders to articulate assumptions and distribute authority to their subordinates. Over time, every major decision at Shell had to be made against one of WAC's scenarios. Peter Schwartz, who succeeded WAC at Shell, was very successful building upon the methods of scenario planning by assembling a large group of specialists and experts who could help shape scenarios by contributing their expertise. I think this is a very important insight. For some, and for me, it is a best practice to involve the judgments of an eclectic group of subject specialists in developing your scenario. Schwartz and his colleagues at the Global Business Network that evolved from the, the scenario planning cell at Shell built a network of specialists who advise corporate leaders with their insights about future trends. At the end of the Cold War, the Defense Department began looking for new strategic planning constructs to help contend with uncertainty. The bottom-up review, which became the Quadrennial Defense Review, articulated a scenario to use in deciding what capabilities to maintain. This was known as Two Major Theater War and the acronym 2MTW. It was articulated in 1993 and again in 1997 by the Defense Department and it, it hypothesized two large conventional conflicts in separate theaters uh, across the globe. As thoughts about this planning construct evolved uh, into the uh, year 2001, the Quadrennial Defense Review began relying on a strategic uh, scenario-based concept known as 1421. The idea was we could defend in one war, defend the homeland uh, that's the one. We could deter four other adversaries. We could swiftly defeat in, in, in two moderate conflicts, and we could decisively defeat to include toppling a foreign government at once. This was the idea of 1421. Um, as scenarios have become more complex, they've evolved, uh, the strategic planning construct in the DoD has evolved into the integrated security construct uh, articulated in the last QDR and um, written about by. Uh, Kathleen Hicks and Samuel Brannon. This is, is a combination of homeland defense, partnership capacity building, high intensity conventional operations, counterterrorism, and other types of global operations conducted over overlapping time frames at different levels of intensity and escalation. So as we can see, scenarios have become uh, very complex and sophisticated over time. Um, Herman Kahn, one of one way that Herman Kahn's original scenarios might have been summarized is with one word, the idea of mega deaths, the idea of many millions of deaths and what that would mean for, for planners. Uh, the integrated security construct, uh, it, it takes more than one word to, to describe these scenarios because we're talking about multiple different potential uh, conflicts in many different places around the world that are truly of a different nature. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, you see Herman Kahn there, up there in, in, in the right corner, and Peter Schwartz of, uh, and uh, Mr. Van der Heiden of the uh, Royal Dutch Shell Strategic Planning Cell. I wanted to point out some literature here, and uh, I wanted to start with two articles at, at the top separated uh, from the rest uh, by Bishop Hines and Collins and Larry Hirshhorn. I really think that these are 
great articles that uh, are, serve as a, as a good introduction uh, both to uh, the state of the art and some of the key issues and considerations in scenario development. Uh, the, the first article I think is the most recent and comprehensive review of um, all of the different methods and, uh, you know, it surveys the knowledge of, of scenario development and it does so quite well and it's quite recent. The second article is an article that I recently discovered uh, written in 1980 by Larry Horshorn, who's an academic at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I, was, I was shocked to find uh, how much of my thoughts uh, Dr. Horshorn had anticipated uh, nearly 30 years before I, I thought I had an original idea. Um, the next three books I point out really because they're significant. Um, the, uh, the book, uh, Thinking About the Unthinkable, was the one where Herman Kahn began to articulate uh, uh, the idea of limited nuclear war and, and how we could survive uh, the aftermath and uh, what that could mean for strategic planning. Kahn was an analyst at RAND and, and he founded another think tank called the Hudson Institute. Uh, Schwartz, The Art of the Long View, and, and Keyes van der Heiden of of uh, uh, the author of Scenarios, The Art of Strategic Conversation. These are uh, two books that talk about the, the shell view on scenarios. I want to encourage you to, to consult the, the journals, which have um, quite a bit of uh, scenario development um, uh, concepts. Um, you see some listed here. Uh, I put the word caution in, in the slide because I think you need to be careful when looking at these journals and the articles in them, you need to really be uh, considerate about the purpose uh, of, of each description of scenarios and the process of developing scenarios because uh, some of these are really about uh, pinpoint predictions and, and what might be called futurism. And, and I don't think that futurism is really what those of us in the, in the uh, strategic analysis community who are focused on planning are, are really all about. Um, but there are other journals in the fields of operations, research, and management that, uh, that have a lot to say about scenarios um, without drifting into sort of speculative prediction. And I think that there are European journals in particular that have a lot to say about scenarios. Next slide. There are many typologies of scenarios, but I like this one from Hirschhorn. Um, he, he starts by saying that you have state and process scenarios. State scenarios merely articulate a set of conditions that exist at some point in the future. Process scenarios tell you how you get there, and they tell a story that evolves over time uh, forward to that point. Going down the line from the process scenarios, he differentiates between end state and beginning state process scenarios. What he's pointing out here is that you can either start with a vision of the future and articulate the story how you uh, accomplish that vision backward from the end state, or you could start with a beginning state and talk about what events follow from that beginning state, articulating your scenario in a process forward in time. Across all, all three of these branches, he differentiates between planning and prediction. I think I've already mentioned that, that for our purposes in strategic analysis, planning is really our emphasis. And, uh, and so you could go down the line here, and, and I would specify that, that what we're talking about here, I think, uh, is really process, beginning state, planning scenarios that are, that are developmental in nature. They're not meant to, to pinpoint some, with accuracy, to pinpoint some prediction of the future. They're meant to help us develop our thoughts about the future and develop ways to cope and contend with uh, potential events. I think there are other ways that you can typify uh, uh, scenarios. Um, you can develop them by inductive or deductive reasoning. Uh, you, you can differentiate between descriptive scenarios and normative scenarios, how we think uh, the wor world will be and how we think the world ought to be. Uh, again, you, you, can, you can talk about longitudinal scenarios and, and, and the duration of scenarios, how long they extend in time. You could also distinguish between scenarios that describe external conditions or, or conditions external to your organization and conditions that are internal to your organization. The bottom line for me is, is, is I think what we're really talking about is, is planning and not prediction. There are some 
dilemmas and trade-offs in scenario development. The question is really, how do you manage them? Scenarios, uh, those who develop scenarios, authors of scenarios are constantly managing different trade-offs. I think the principal one is the trade-off between realism and utility. Uh, we acknowledge that that scenarios are fundamentally on, unreal. That doesn't mean that we don't want some, some realism, because if they're about a completely unreal future, uh, then their utility is really questionable. Um, and, and we want to be sure when we say utility that they're focused on the particular concerns we have when we embarked upon uh, a particular study or, or line of inquiry. So you're always balancing between the two, and I think you have to design your methods to manage them well. Um, in one case, uh, we actually, in, in this project I want to tell you about, we actually uh, used one method to focus on developing realistic uh, concepts of scenarios and then followed it with another method that, that then selected from among those realistic scenarios the ones which we thought might be most useful. So uh, that's what I mean, that, that you have to select and structure, manage, uh, and structure methods to balance between these trade-offs. Um, similarly, I think you also want to allow for surprise and surprising events to, to uh, come into your scenario, but you want to maintain their plausibility. Um, complexity and, and, and patience, the more sophisticated a scenario gets, the, obviously the more work it takes to produce and, and the more time it takes to produce. Some of the scenario projects uh, in the Defense Department take multiple years uh, to conclude, and, and this is quite frustrating to those who eventually use them. And I think, you know, time is money, and uh, it's important to point out that, that you can do things uh, quickly with more money or, or, or you can do things otherwise. I think another important dilemma is, is, is to, that we grapple with the uh, objectification of human judgment in scenarios. Because we really cannot predict the future, uh, we have to rely on judgment, especially when we're dealing with questions of irregular warfare or, or, or social instability. And so it, it's really quite difficult to reconcile conflicting uh, uh, expert judgments. And I think, you know, one of the best ways to do that is, is if you have the means, bring those experts together and force them to reconcile with each other under the leadership of a facilitator whose job it is to keep things polite. Let's go to the next slide. I think it's important to begin to analyze the scenario development process uh, using this timeline that we created to um, break down a generic sequence of tenses. Uh, we have to reason through time. So we begin uh, assuming again that we're talking about a future scenario in the real present, in, in, in the here and now. And recognizing that everything that takes place in our scenario takes place in the real future we want to break down time within our scenario because it helps us to uh, develop our methods against which to uh, produce the scenario. Every scenario begins somewhere, and it begins somewhere in the future. We call that moment the scenario past. Between the real present and the scenario past, somehow, even if it's just a day, we have to e extrapolate and account for intervening events. That's why I've called that duration the extrapolation period. I would argue you need a method or means or you at least need to think about how you're going to extrapolate from the present to the scenario past. But the scenario past is the beginning of your story. It's where you articulate some interesting possibility that works forward to the scenario present. What is the scenario present? It, it's really where uh, it's, it's that moment in time in which you are really interested. Uh, it's when your analysis kicks off. So the scenario period between the scenario past and the scenario present is where you're telling that scene-setting story. After the scenario present, we extend into the scenario future, and this is when I think uh, you know, your research or your game or your study or your analysis uh, really is conducted in earnest. And it's conducted on the basis of the, uh, of the events you developed prior. So I, I would advise you know, that we use a, a generic sequence of, of scenario tenses to deconstruct the, uh, 
the process of, of scenario development. Next slide. So I, I want to introduce, I mentioned him earlier, Harvey DeWeird. Uh, Harvey DeWeird was a, uh, uh, a War Department historian in, in the United States during World War II uh, who came to the RAND Corporation uh, during, I think, you know, what was the height of, of RAND's employment of, uh, of, of scenario-based studies and observed that, uh, that the common way that people developed scenarios is to begin with some vision of the future, however it was derived, and in a work backwards in time, developing uh, hypothetical events that lead logically and conclude in that vision of events. And, and he argued that we needed a contextual approach to scenario construction, saying that context is that set of conditions that really exist in, in, in the real present. Um, he said the process of scenario construction commonly in use ought to be reversed. The scenario should emerge from the context, not the context from the scenario. And I think this is uh, an oblique criticism of um, scenario-based studies that are designed to justify a particular outcome by uh, uh, resting upon a set of assumptions that were in turn designed to uh, terminate in that outcome. So the weird's axis of scenario development efforts really works forward in time, whereas the rather predominant uh, commonplace axis of scenario development tends to work the other way around, backward in time. And I think uh, it, it's worth noting, especially when you're, you're working in irregular warfare and, and social instability, that, that beginning with current context is, is really important. So we'll go to the next slide. When we reason through time, in, according to the DeWeird axis working forward, using those tenses, we can find ourselves asking during the extrapolation period, for example, what if event X happens in the not too distant future? And that's our extrapolation. And according to syllogistic logic, we might say subsequently, what if event Y, or really events Y, plural, also happens? And these could kind of be the, the, the events that uh, exist in the scenario period. Then we might ask, what could be the event Z that follows from X and Y? And I think those events Z are really the, the, uh, the uh, events that you're concerned about and the events that your research and analysis are focused upon. Next slide. Um, there is a, uh, uh, a professor of national security analysis who has used this syllogistic logic uh, to develop a method he calls, or a framework really, he calls counterfactual reasoning. And, and I think it's helpful to structure scenario development. Counterfactual reasoning, according to Professor Hendrickson, is a rational process of evaluating conditional claims about alter alternate possibilities and their consequences. I want to emphasize that this isn't uh, an instruction manual. It's a way of thinking, and it's, a, it's a, a concept that he's used to try to educate undergraduate analysts at James Madison University. But I think what it provides authors of scenarios is, is a method to decompose and scrutinize the scenarios and a lexicon and a structure to unify scenario development methods. And although the, the lexicon uh, is a bit, um, it's a bit awkward, um, you know, I think it's still useful. And it's awkward, uh, if you flip to the next slide, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, whereas I was talking about ifs, ands, and thens two slides prior, uh, uh, Dr. Hendrickson recasts these as antecedents, intermediate states, and consequent states. And uh, if you use this framework of if, and, then, or antecedent, intermediate, and consequent states, I think you can really decompose any scenario. So in this example, if Iran acquired nuclear weapons and Iran transfers this technology to Hezbollah, then Hezbollah conducts a nuclear attack against the United States. And, and I want to emphasize this is just an illustrative example. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we can say that the antecedent, the if clause in this statement, is the origin of the possibility we want to examine in our scenario. It's what happens in the scenario past. And uh, when Iran transfers this technology to Hezbollah, this is a, uh, 
uh, an important event or an independent trend that is concurrent with this interesting possibility because we have to recognize that scenarios do not occur in a vacuum. They are influenced by and effective, uh, affected by what happens elsewhere. The consequent is the conclusion of that possibility. When we say then Hezbollah conducts a nuclear attack in the United States, this is where, really where our scenario kicks off. It's that, it's that moment of interest in the scenario present, and it's the possibility we ultimately want to examine. So if we go to the next slide, we can talk about some methods, and I think we can start to see how you can levy particular methods against information requirements that you have for each period of your scenario. So trend extrapolation, and I, I don't know all of these that well. Uh, some of these um, I've worked on quite a bit, so I'm just going to review them somewhat uh, quickly. Uh, trend extrapolation is, uh, is the idea that you would just take a regression line against current trends and extend them forward. And this might be a, a technique that is useful, uh, especially when you're dealing with quantified data, and it might be a good way to get to the scenario past or to develop those if components of your scenario. Moving down to structured scenario fusion, this is a, is a technique also developed by Dr. Hendrickson that allows you to reconcile different visions of the future and to integrate them in a logical way, thereby uh, combining scenarios and deriving those intermediate states. Because when you start to merge different scenarios, you start to see how the events in one theater or, or one set of events start to affect one another. If, for example, you know, uh, large forces aren't, aren't available to respond to a particular scenario, that's one example of, of an and event that, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that emerges when you start to, to merge scenarios together. I think most of us think of gaming as, as, a, as a, an analytic uh, uh, as an analytic tool that, that makes use of scenarios, but I think we should also think of gaming as a way to develop scenarios themselves. And in fact, in this project uh, that I'm about to speak about, uh, uh, Dr. Perla at the uh, Center for Naval Analysis used wargaming to help uh, develop the ands and thens of a particular defense scenario. You can also consult with your experts via a structured interview or some sort of survey. Uh, you can apply historical analogies to develop any of your information requirements. And then as you get more sophisticated, you, know, you might use a technique like general morphological analysis or the analytic hierarchy process. Uh, I'm going to say some more about general morphological analysis here in a minute. But uh, that's a technique that, that we used uh, to derive the if components of our scenarios. So next slide, diving into GMA. This is a method for multidimensional, non-quantified inference modeling of social messes. And like a lot of the other methods, it relies upon expert facilitation, workshops with diverse groups of subject specialists, and repeated analysis and synthesis of complex problems. I'm presenting it here just to give you an example of one method you might use in your scenario development project. Tom Ritchie, who is, a, uh, who is at the Swedish uh, equivalent of the, of the Applied Research Projects or the Advanced Research Projects Agency really de developed general morphological analysis from concept, concepts first put forward by the acclaimed astrophysicist uh, Fritz Zwicky, Zwicky, who was active at Caltech in the 20s and 30s. We found that GMA employed subject specialist knowledge of current context to explore future possibilities, and it provided a possibility generator for producing our antecedents or our if statements. An overview of the process, and this is really a simplification, goes as follows. If you've got a messy problem, you define many parameters of that complex problem. Then you populate those parameters with values or ranges for each parameter, uh, or, or you, you populate that parameter with values and, uh, and really with data. These are possible states that could describe that parameter. And you assess the internal consistency of every possible configuration of values. And what you get is a inference model, a model that tells you with non-quantified information across many dimensions what will happen if a particular value uh, is to exist at some point in the future. So moving forward to the slide entitled GMA Step 1, you define the parameters. And here I've given you a generic 
seven parameter morphological field that describes uh, some area of concern in scenario like terms. You've got your economic conditions, your environmental conditions, your conditions of governance, and some places where we might expect conflict. What we do is with a group of experts in a facilitated setting, if you go to the next slide entitled GMA Step 2, we define values and really we go for ranges of values. For example, under your economy, you could have high economic growth ranging all the way to complete collapse. And this gives uh, 27,000 a priori possibilities if you consider all the combinations. Step three in the next slide, we begin to uh, conduct a cross-consistency assessment. What we want to do is reduce the set of possible combinations wherever there are pairwise logical inconsistencies. So if you go to the next slide where you see two values highlighted in red, these are the values of state failure and improved human rights, political accommodation, and transparency. I apologize for the spelling error. You know, you can say that this is an incompatible, uh, incompatible combination of values and it allows for the elimination of every solution involving this pair. If you go to the next slide, you could see two very optimistic possibilities in green. Uh, and, and so you see this combination of values describing uh, an extrapolated possibility I I in the future. And uh, I say there are two of them because these are, these are logically consistent combinations if you consider both high economic growth or uh, improving economic conditions as, as a possibility. So if you go to the next slide, we get to the idea of inferences. If you hold, for example, in this case, three, uh, uh, or three economic possibilities constant and two uh, possibilities about negotiations with dissidents constant, you might derive 18, using multiplication, potential if statements involving those conditions. Next slide. Now, I wanted to just highlight the methods and say a few words about them. I only have a few minutes left. The uh, table here is taken from that article I recommended earlier in the presentation. These are a, a bunch of, uh, of a group of different techniques that they suggest are useful in developing scenarios. And some of these I have really never encountered before. But I think it's important to see how they've uh, characterized them. They've differentiated between judgment-based and, and, and quantified uh, uh, bases for uh, different techniques. Um, they've differentiated between the forward and backward perspectives. They've uh, discussed, they, they've highlighted which techniques really require groups and uh, which, which ones do not require groups. I, I'm, I'm amused by the genius technique that does not require a group. Um, <laughs> And I think that they referred directly to Herman Kahn when they spoke about this technique. Some of the techniques, it's really helpful if you have a computer. Uh, general morphological analysis is one where if you have a computer, you don't need the computer, but it's really helpful because it reduces the time and effort needed to compute possibilities. And they've applied some rating scale uh, that is an attempt to show you which ones they deem the most difficult. Uh, the point here is that there are many different ways um, some of these fall, fall under the category of problem structuring methods, um, but there's no need to be satisfied with a scenario that was derived from speculation and conjecture uh, or, or horse trading. Um, there is every reason to believe that you can derive a scenario, produce a scenario using a combination of, of methodical uh, techniques, and you could do so in a fashion that is transparent and, um, and defensible and repeatable. So we go to the next slide, which is a summary. My advice is that you ascertain first, uh, if you have a study, why you need a scenario or a war game. Uh, and if your purposes are not really for strategic analysis in the sense I've described today, uh, planning and defense and national security, I, I, I really would suggest you don't reply, rely upon my advice. I think you need to assess those trade-offs and you need to develop a plan, structure your methods, and order your methods in order to uh, contend with those trade-offs. I think you need to, uh, I would recommend applying the generic sequence of scenario tenses, working forward, not backward in time. And the reason I, I advocate this is, is because uh, I, I think um, 
we, we should not be satisfied with scenarios that begin with some inexplicable vision of the future and work backward unless that is your particular intent. I think you should de decompose scenarios according to tenses and, and, and logic of the syllogism as described by Dr. Hendrickson. I think you need to then identify your information requirements and choose well-defined methods to fill those specific inform information requirements. I think you need to implement the method faithfully and especially be prepared to uh, accept surprising results because I think that's what happens when you do use a well-structured method. You get surprising results and you, and you have to be willing to integrate them. And I think it's also productive to do so because you are better prepared for, for things that uh, we as individuals perhaps did not expect. My last piece of advice, and, and this is really commonplace, but you know, be flexible. The, the scenario methods often require adaptation or modification, and, and you rarely get a, a method out of the box that accomplishes everything you want. Um, and sometimes when you involve human beings and, and the judgment that they present, uh, you have some um, intellectual grappling to do in order to integrate their ideas. So uh, with that, I want to conclude and open the floor to questions. I really thank you for your attention. Some of this material is quite dry. I hope you see I'm, I'm interested and eager uh, to, to hear your questions. And, uh, and I want to thanks, thank you once more, uh, Ellie and Katie, for inviting me to make this presentation. Thank you very much, Alec, for taking the time to put together such a nice presentation for us today. Um, at this point, we'd like to begin the Q&A session, but before I do that, I'm going to um, unmute everybody's line from the system standpoint, so just be aware that your line is no longer muted, and if you'd like to personally mute your own line, you can hit star six. To enter the Q&A session, um, please... Uh, please pe press star zero one and that will enter you into the queue. Um, and once we have some people who have enter entered questions, I will um, begin to answer those questions. They'll be in the order that they are entered, um, and we'll be able to see, and then Alec can begin answering the questions once we have some. So if you have a question, please hit uh, star zero one uh, to enter into the queue. I, I am really quite pleased to have covered this ground uh, so well. <laughs> Um, I, I say that jokingly, um, but uh, I, I really uh, appreciate your attention. And um, you know, if there's anybody who has questions or want, wants to follow up uh, separately, uh, my email address is there on the last slide, and I'd be more than happy to entertain those uh, independently. Can you say a little bit more? You, you said how you would use war games to develop scenarios. Can you say a little bit more about how you would choose scenarios for a war game? I think that's a great question. Um, the, uh, the war game we conducted at the Center for Naval Analysis began, uh, it, it was intended to develop those consequence, uh, those then statements of a, of, of a series of scenarios we had begun to develop uh, over a year earlier. And so you asked, well, what do you begin with? Well, what we began with was the, the if statements or the antecedents that, uh, that we developed using general morphological analysis and a facilitated scenario election. I'll say a little bit about that. Once we uh, developed a, a, a set of scenarios or, or potential scenarios or proto-scenarios using morphological analysis, we, we had assessed that these were the logically possible set of scenarios. And then we engaged all of the stakeholders in the Defense Department and elsewhere in the United States government, and, and we asked them a bunch of questions in a, in a facilitated and structured way. Uh, we asked them questions about those scenarios, and we asked them to provide uh, a, a psychometric measures of their interest in the scenarios. And uh, in this way, we were able to, to pluck from among the original set a few that were really interesting to all the stakeholders. Then we went into a war game, and we brought together people who knew the, uh, both the, the technical disciplines and the, uh, who had the area specialty to talk about those scenarios in more depth, and we asked them to role play. And so what we really had was a, uh, you know, a, a facilitated role playing situation where Dr. Perla played uh, 
uh, God for more or less. And, and then uh, we asked the different constituencies represented by players to react to each other and to live with the decisions that they made as they played out the consequences uh, uh, of a scenario, and that of a proto-scenario. And that allowed us to judge their utility and to add additional detail and content in a way that, that flushed out uh, uh, the rest of the scenario. The analogy we often used was to say, if uh, morphological analysis wrote the first two chapters of a 10-chapter book, uh, we used a variety of other techniques and wargaming to write the remaining eight chapters as time went on. Hi, Alec. This is Eric Walters of the Marine Corps Intelligence Schools. I'm looking at uh, slide 26, the, the table four on those, uh, those techniques and attributes, and I, I noticed with some amusement that genius is, cons is the least difficult with a value of 1.2, so it would tell me that uh, genius is probably the preferred uh, method, which of course isn't true. I'm familiar with some other methods that aren't listed here, like quadrant crunching and alternative futures and Lockwood analytical techniques. Is there any effort to uh, provide a comprehensive catalog of techniques and kind of characterize them more than what we see here so that people can find the right techniques at the right difficulty to hit a sweet spot in doing scenario development? Thank you. I really appreciate that question. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a terrific question, really, for the ladies at Castle and for their colleagues. Um, I believe that this presentation is in part an effort to try to bring together um, a, a comprehensive catalog of, of all the different methods. And, and I, I know that the bibliography that Ellie maintains is, is also an effort. Um, I would point to one other organization I'm familiar with that, uh, that really focuses on these. This is a, a group of um, intelligence uh, activities in the Five Eyes analytic community that meets uh, biannually to uh, review analytic techniques exclusively, and they have a multi-day conference where they go through all of these techniques. Uh, Dr. Henderson, who I mentioned at, at uh, James Madison, his Institute for National Security Analysis is a sponsor. The, the Defense Intelligence Agency is a sponsor. And there's an, uh, an intelligence analysis uh, program, an undergraduate program at um, Ole Miss in Mississippi that also uh, participates. Um, they're meeting actually next month in, I think, Lithicum, Maryland. And, yes. uh, and, and, and I think that's a, that's a great place uh, to, to look at some of these techniques, although the purposes for which they're applied is, is you know, for intelligence analysis and prediction less than planning, which was the purpose I talked about today. And that appears to be the last question that we have in the queue. Uh, Alec, again, thank you very much for putting this together for us. Um, to everybody who's still on the line, this will be up on the website within the next week. And we thank you very much for participating.